Today's case takes us to Carlsbad, a region that sits on the coast of California, an expensive place to live, specifically as housing costs are the main issue. Those fortunate enough to live there, or are holidaying, can enjoy its coastal beauty. There are miles of pristine beaches, with endless opportunities for sunbathing, surfing, and enjoying breathless sunsets over the Pacific Ocean. However, in 2016, something sinister took place within this region between a woman named Diana Lovejoy and her estranged husband, Greg Mulville, or was it pronounced Mulvihill? They were coming to the end of a bitter divorce battle. Hi, my friend, I'm Royston, and welcome back to Tea and Crime. Now, this story is filled with some terrible allegations designed to blacken an innocent man's character. Another man had an affair with a woman who lied and manipulated him like a soft piece of clay. And that woman was well-educated, with a master's degree in shedding crocodile tears while convincing people to believe everything she said. Well, almost. To put some context to this, I think it's time for a deep dive. Diana Lovejoy was a software technical writer, earning in excess of $100,000 per year. Additionally, she was a fitness instructor as well as a decent athlete and YouTuber who in 2007 married computer programmer Greg Mulvihill. Together, they bought a house in Carlsbad where they settled into married life. They were both rather adventurous who loved outside activities such as swimming and hiking. In addition to that, Diana had a passion for cooking. In fact, she created a YouTube channel where she shared healthy cooking tips. Take a listen. I'm Diana Lovejoy and quick meals are my specialty. I know that you don't have all day. We've got malice to feed. Welcome to my kitchen where I really like to cook, but I'm often short on time. So speed is the hook. <laughs> I don't know what it is. But she reminded me of the Wicked Witch of the West from The Wizard of Oz. Maybe that's because she was just as wicked, or perhaps even more so. How about a little fire, Scarecrow? Anyway, the couple were keen to start a family, but unfortunately, they experienced an astonishing eight miscarriages before Diana finally gave birth to their son in 2012. Just before the birth, they were both totally stressed out, to the point animosity had built up between them, leading to the need for marriage counselling. Maybe it had something to do with the food Diana was cooking. I'll show you how to make a meal in almost no time flat. Takes less than half an hour and you'll have it done pat. The recipes from Kraft, who makes fantastic tasty stuff, that's partially prepared, so dinner's not too tough. So first, get out some angel hair and get ready to go. Just cook per the instructions, six minutes or so. Just saying. However, the counselling was intended to help rebuild their marriage, but sadly the relationship disintegrated and they eventually separated in, in June 2014. This triggered a two-year battle regarding issues such as child custody and financial matters. It seems to be the financial matters that played a significant role in this story. After enduring eight heartbreaking miscarriages, it understandably created all kinds of stress for the couple. The only good news was this. They managed to have a child together in the end. The bad news was this picture. Oh, sorry, I mean their relationship ending in turmoil. Diana, being that manipulative character, had an idea of how to keep hold of her son for herself. What she did was extremely wicked. She made claims of inappropriate sexual behaviour exhibited from Greg toward her, but not only her, she alleged he was also interfering with their little boy who by now was aged two. Lovejoy went out of her way to obtain a temporary restraining order against him, leaving Greg to become homeless, spending nights sleeping in his car initially, 
everything was falling in her favour. Authorities then conducted a lengthy investigation into the serious allegations, allegations Greg immediately denied. Nonetheless, he was prevented from seeing his son because of the claims, until it was decided he was allowed access again. And unfortunately for him, the access, when it came, it had to be supervised. And not long after that, he was granted time with his son, unsupervised, which was a good sign things were being sorted out as Child Protective Services were investigating the claim. Then in November 2015, Greg was awarded 50% custody of the little boy and the reason was his estranged wife's accusations were unfounded. Mr Mulvihill was in fact a good man and it was determined he was a better parent between the two. A few months later in mid-2016, Diana and Greg agreed on a marital settlement where she was able to keep the family home but was required to pay Greg $120,000. That had to be done within 90 days. Custody of the child remained 50-50. And Lovejoy was furious inside even though she agreed to those terms. Her real desire was to pay nothing while having full control of the child. But that was okay because she had a plan. The previous year in 2015, she attended shooting lessons at the Iron Sights gun range, where she met a man who hated seeing women in distress. In actual fact, he had a track record of helping other women in the past with similar issues. And this man not only became her personal firearm instructor privately, but he entertained some type of superhero complex and considered himself as her saviour. He viewed Diana as a damsel in distress and felt she was rather fit-looking, for some reason. He listened to the problems she put out to him over the ensuing months, and she told him about, well, about the sexual allegations Greg made toward her and the three-year-old. Additionally, she talked about Greg being involved in drugs and had threatened to do something bad to her. Yes, she was painting a good old story about Greg, she explained her case was taken to the authorities, but guess what? They failed her, and that Greg was given treatment he clearly didn't deserve. Over time, she communicated with this guy, not just in the shooting range, but over the phone or by text. It was getting personal. They actually developed a close bond that led to sharing a, a bed together. Even though her instructor was a married man, with a child of his own. Diana spoke to other people about her dire situation. Well, that's how she saw it. And one of them was her auntie, also named Diana, who she met up with at a local restaurant on Christmas Day in 2015. Although it's normal to meet up to discuss issues in a place like that, the problem was Diana had something sinister on her mind. She popped a question to her aunt who I'm sure was absolutely shocked by it, asking her if she knew, if she knew any killers. Do you know anyone who's prepared to go Greg for me? She inquired. I'll pay him. Fortunately, her aunt didn't, but again, that's okay, because Superman was being worked up into a frenzy. The so-called superhero I'm talking about is named Weldon McDavid. This guy, a retired rifle and pistol expert from the US Marines where he spent 12 years. He was now her firearm instructor. Okay, today I'm going to teach the five minute shooting lesson made famous here at the shooting range I work at. First thing, uh, they're shooting on the other side. Yeah, that was him. And after spending time together in bed because they had that kind of a relationship, it was decided an action plan needed attention. It was now August 2016, and as far as McDavid was concerned, Lovejoy was the victim. Of course she was. Diana manipulated him like a piece of clay in that bedroom. Remember, $120,000 was at stake. The marital settlement had only been reached a couple of months previously in June meaning Diana had a few weeks left before paying Greg off within the 90-day deadline. 
Leading up to the deadline, Lovejoy and McDavid finalised their plan. Well, first of all, Diana paid the superhero $1,000 in advance as they conspired to murder Greg. She promised another $1,000 after the deed was done. $2,000 measly dollars was the agreed sum to end an innocent man's life. In order for McDavid to contact Greg, the idea of a burner phone came up. Now, Diana didn't think twice about purchasing one if it meant her ex was about to be... was about to be eliminated. Paying McDavid $2,000 plus a little bit extra for a burner phone was a much cheaper option than handing her ex a buttload of money. It felt like a proper bargain. What happened next was a little bit on the comedic side if you get my drift, because on the 1st of September 2016, at about 10.30pm, Greg received a call from an unknown number. Now we know it came from McDavid, Greg didn't. Weldon informed Greg he was a private investigator. He rang several times that night, offering valuable information pertaining to Mr. Mulvihill's pending divorce and custody dispute, even though all of that was almost over. Weldon specified that Diana had some dirt on Greg, and if he wanted to learn about it, he had an opportunity to do so, after which he could buy it if it was of interest. Chillingly, he invited Greg to a location just off Rancho Santa Fe Road in Carlsbad, directing him to a power pole, where he said the important documents could be found. From the entrance of this dark, secluded place, the pole was roughly 150 feet away. What bothered me was this. Who in their right mind would consider following those kind of instructions from someone, from someone they didn't know? Now look, I'm not trying to disrespect Greg, as he was innocent. However, even though he was innocent, he was stupid. I'll give him some credit though, because before he chose to go along with this, he did make a non-emergency phone call to the police, telling a dispatcher about his unusual circumstance and his concerns about it, so that was a good thing. He inquired of the police if that was normal practice from private investigators. And the reply, you know, it indicated it was a little unusual, but if he wanted to go, go ahead. Surely that was bad advice. But that call from the man who said he was a professional got him thinking. He was worried the information would reopen the child custody case, and he didn't want that, especially after working so hard over so long to clear his name. Weldon rang him again, and by now Greg had made up his mind to take a look at this information. At least he wasn't daft enough to go alone, we'll give him that. A friend of his named Jason, this guy, agreed to go with him, and what brought another smile to my face was when they arrived at the location. Greg was carrying a bicycle flashlight to illuminate the track they were walking down toward the pole, whereas Jason, <laughs> he held onto a mini baseball bat instead of having something like this. This in our pants yet? I guess he brought the baby bat along just in case they ran into trouble. <laughs> Maybe he was thinking he could use it to fend off potential attackers without inflicting maximum damage one might expect from a <laughs> from a full-size bat. That's what went through my mind regarding the bat he was carrying. However, they were there now. It was just after 11 at night. Greg was nervously shining his light as they searched for the pole. McDavid said the documents would be taped to it, but things got a little tricky. The only thing they found was this towel at the base of the pole. When they realised the document wasn't there, suspicion fell upon them. As Greg started scanning the area with his flashlight, he heard a noise in the bushes, so shined his torch in that direction, where someone was spotted lying on their stomach, about 60 feet away, in camouflage gear, pointing a sniper rifle at them. One of them shouted in a panic, RUN! As they were fleeing the scene, Shots were fired. One of the bullets hit Greg in his chest. However, they made it back to Greg's vehicle and drove off, but had to pull over shortly afterward. Jason then immediately made this call. Hello, this is 911. Yeah, hi, 
I, uh, my friend has just been shot. Do you know who shot him? There's a guy lying down like a sniper. A sniper? Did you see him at all? Briefly, we saw the, the gun, and he shot at us like six or seven times. Law enforcement swiftly responded, resulting in Greg being taken to hospital for immediate surgery. If that medical care wasn't available, he would have died, as it was a serious gunshot wound. Fortunately, he was a very lucky man and survived. In the meantime, a police SWAT team investigated the area where the shooting occurred, looking for the bad guy. Initially, they believed it was someone random, maybe even a crazy individual, still prowling around on the hunt for other victims. Now, after a thorough search, very little was discovered. Not even the shell casings were found, indicating whoever the shooter was seemed experienced as he or she collected those casings before disappearing into the night. But they weren't that experienced, really, as something was left behind. Near the pole was a discharged bullet jacket that looked something like this one. It had been fired from a rifle like this. And two towels were also discovered. The one that Greg and Jason saw, plus another one located nearby. Something unexpected surprised investigators regarding one of the towels. It was enveloped in shite. In other words, nature called. Someone had to go. They did a number two. And wiped themselves with the towel. Ugh! Now if that was a shooter, they didn't think that one through. As we'll discover shortly. Jason was questioned regarding the situation, who told them about that mysterious phone call Greg received from a so-called private investigator. When Greg was recovering, he explained to authorities it was that phone call that led him to the dirt road. He also provided them the phone number of the so-called PI. He went on to talk about his bitter divorce battle, but felt this had nothing to do with the witch, uh, I mean with Diana. The story sounded absolutely crazy, leaving those involved scratching their heads. The phone number Greg provided was traced to a burner phone, and they established it was purchased in mid-August from a Best Buy store, which conveniently had surveillance footage highlighting who the buyer was. Who do you think it might be? Well, let's take a look. As you can see, it was Diana. She strolled into the store looking pretty relaxed before strolling out again with the burner phone, which was to, well, you know, to be used for the deadly deed. The footage made the police sit up. The next logical step was to visit Diana. As expected, when they arrived, she told them she knew nothing about such a horrible occurrence with reference to what happened to Greg. She heard about the crime, but was telling them, who would do such a terrible thing to my ex? It's just awful. I can't even get my head around it. This is how she presented herself to them, trying to convince the investigators that that crime and her were not connected. But they weren't buying that. They knew she bought something and felt it was important to show her the evidence. The evidence revealed, as we've just seen, that she bought the burner phone. And the burner phone's number matched the phone that contacted Greg. Once she heard that, her story started to change. She was like, ah, oh, hold on, I, I remember now. I did purchase a phone, but let me explain why. The story she told them implicated Weldon McDavid, who she admitted was a man she was having an affair with. As she told Weldon about the problems within a marriage and how she was scared of Greg, and according to her, McDavid was furious about Greg's behaviour. So, he offered to help Diana to bring this messy, messy, messy divorce to an end. Therefore, she hired him for a total of $2,000 with the objective of scaring Greg, she said. The idea was to make her ex fearful somehow, so that he would hopefully give Diana full custody of their little boy, while at the same time to discourage his alleged unpleasant drug taking and sexual advances both toward Diana and the child. She continued by saying she had no idea Weldon would actually take a gun to shoot her ex. That wasn't in the plan. That's down to McDavid. It's out of my control what he did, implying she wasn't aware of how far he was willing to take it. 
and this is what she was trying to get across to the authorities. Obviously, once they learned about McDavid, the police brought him in for an interview, which was a week after the event. I'm asking you where you were at last where you get shot. What location? Rancho Santa Fe, Avenida Soledad. And I don't know that location. You notice how he denied any knowledge, not just regarding the shooting, but being unfamiliar with the area where the offence took place. That came across strongly. However, he eventually admitted he was there, and it was him who used one of the towels at the location, as if it was, let's just say, toilet paper. On a dirt road, just running along, and I did have to shit. The reason he eventually told the truth was because they explained to him his DNA was recovered <laughs> from his own shite. He was asked where the towels came from. Apparently, they were already there as if by magic. And it turned out they matched the set of towels identified at Diana's residence. And at Weldon's home, which was adequately searched, authorities found the rifle, alongside several shell casings, used to get the nasty deed done, even though it wasn't quite done. Enough evidence was secured to arrest both him and Diana. Their joint trial began in October 2017, a year after the shooting. McDavid testified in his defence, whereas Diana didn't. However, McDavid's argument centred around his apparent incredible skill as an accurate shooter. His attorney for McDavid says, as an expert in firearms, if McDavid wanted to kill Mulvihill, he could have easily... And those shots were simply warning shots. Marines are taught if they wanted to kill someone, two to the center, max, one to the head. I did not intend to shoot Mr. Mulvihill. I'm sorry that I shot Mr. Mulvihill. It was an aiming error, as I stated previously. He says he was only trying to shoot a light in Mulvihill's hand and missed. If I had intended to kill Mr. Mulvihill, he would have been dead. Never intended that. I personally have a problem with those claims, and I'll tell you why. If he was such an incredible marksman with the intention of shooting the light Mr. Mulverhill was carrying, no matter how one might interpret this, he missed. Instead, he shot Greg in his left armpit with a bullet exiting his back, almost killing him. But he was saying the facts he missed demonstrated his lack of intent, as he deliberately made sure not to hit Greg. The question is, who in their right mind would aim a seriously lethal weapon at someone to shoot a light from their hand? Plus, Marines are taught never to point a gun at anyone unless they intend to kill. Maybe he got rusty, he wasn't practicing enough, or it might have even been the Mexican food he ate just before the shooting. Perhaps it affected his equilibrium. And remember, he did leave a big pile of shite behind at the crime scene. The joint trial was eye-opening. Jurors heard details about the bitter divorce battle. They listened to claims made against Greg, such as he was allegedly assaulting, you know, both Diana and their little boy while pumping illegal substances into his system, all of which was categorically proven to be untrue after substantial as well as inconvenient evaluations which were conducted on Greg. It was clear Diana, who cried a lot during the trial, would much rather pay a conspirator a measly $2,000 to kill her ex than part with $120,000, which Greg more than deserved. She purchased a burner phone, specifically used to convincingly lie to that poor man, with the intention of luring Greg to his planned death. It was also revealed during the trial that Diana's whereabouts on the night in question was picked up via a cell phone tower, indicating she was in the vicinity of that dirt track. In fact, Weldon admitted she met him at this park and ride spot before dropping him off at that secluded location and picked him up again after the bod job. Both Greg and his friend Jason relived the trauma presented to them on that night, remembering what was pointing at them from the bushes. After the second time of shining the light on it and 
staring at it for a second, I realized I was looking at a barrel and a scope of a gun. I just remember seeing someone laying prone on the ground um, with the, the, the gun, which I thought was a, looked like a sniper rifle with a gun a silencer on it or something, pointing, pointing towards me laying in, the, in a prone like shooting position. The only reason Mr. McDavid attempted to murder Greg was because Diana had convinced him he was a terrible husband and father who didn't deserve anything good from life. And what turned out to be the final nail in the coffin was when Diana testified, not Lovejoy, we're talking about her auntie with the same name, who told the court that in December 2015, Lovejoy asked her if she knew anyone who would be prepared to kill Greg. Now one jury said, that was amongst the strongest piece of evidence presented to them. And as a result of all of this damning evidence, the jury came to their verdict after deliberating for less than half a day. And as the verdict was being read, this happened. We, the jury, in the above entitled cause, find the defendant, Weldon K. McDavid, guilty of the crime of conspiracy to commit murder. Lovejoy was unconscious for a time, then taken to a hospital for treatment. Court was adjourned briefly, then back in session for the two verdicts to be read against McDavid. He also found guilty on both charges. After court, the jury foreperson said the defense version didn't seem plausible. The defense seemed almost too far-fetched. Too far-fetched, it certainly was. It seemed to me like Diana couldn't believe what happened. After everything she put her ex through, it still came as an unexpected shock when she was found guilty of premeditated attempted murder and conspiracy to commit murder, being sentenced to 26 years to life while Weldon got 50 years to life. Yet she was the mastermind behind it. If it wasn't for the way she manipulated Weldon, Greg would never have been shot. But the driving force behind the crime gets a lighter sentence and still can't believe it. Interesting. Once her central nervous system recovered after the fainting episode, she was back in court and had this to say. I still care about Greg in as much as he. I did love him. I loved him a lot. And I really cared about him and I still care about Greg. I would never take Kale's father away from him. Those crocodile tears were the type that affected Weldon to do her dirty work, but they didn't affect the judge or jury who saw straight through them. Another thing that stood out to me was this. After Weldon's sentence, he talked about how he regretted having an affair with Diana. That was his biggest disappointment, implying it was unsatisfying while hurting his marriage. However, he failed to mention having any regret for the attempted murder, even though he was asked more than once if that was regrettable. The lesson we can take away from that is don't have an affair. That's lesson one. And trying to murder someone, well, that could be lesson two. However, lesson two didn't even enter his mind. Overall, it's unbelievable how inefficient both Diana and Weldon were. As criminals, they were amateurs. And looking at this case is actually a very good lesson for criminals on what not to do. And what I'd encourage anyone watching this video not to do is meet a private investigator in a dark, secluded area at night, particularly if the individual is unknown to you. <laughs> well, I'm Royston. Thanks for watching. And I'll see you in the next one.